two years ago on Rob's Retro Reviews. During the festive period, I was given a parcel from an unknown source. Attached was a note which told me not to let the contents of this mystery gift out of my sight. Inside the present was nothing more than a monkey. I didn't think anything of it and proceeded to make my annual Christmas special review, but as I was wrapping up, the monkey sprang into action and ran away. I gave chase, running after him through a forest. The monkey was proving to be a worthy adversary, but I caught up with him fast. Just as I was about to catch the critter, I made the fatal error of tripping on a log. The monkey saw his opportunity and grabbed my net, using it against me. Now, prepare for part two of the story. Welcome to this Christmas special of Rob's Retro Reviews. Seeing as I'm trapped in this room until I complete this, I figured I might as well review it at the same time. So today, we're diving into the world of Ape Escape 3. Now, I did review Ape Escape 2 a whole two years ago on my channel, so I'll put a link to that in the description if you want to watch it. Just bear in mind though, the video has dated quite a lot since I made it. Ape Escape 3 was created by Sony Computer Entertainment's Japan Studio and released on July 14th, 2005 in Japan. It didn't see a release in America until January 17th, 2006 and wasn't out in Europe until May 5th, 2006. It took a whole 10 months after its initial release in Japan to make its way over here, which is just crazy. Like the previous two main entries in the series, Ape Escape 3 is a 3D collectathon platformer where you use gadgets to capture the main collectibles in the game, which are monkeys. One of the standout things about the Ape Escape series is how the main collectible is also the main enemy, which I've always thought was a really interesting idea that's perfectly executed across the series. Before the game even begins, we're blasted in the face by a thumping tune to really get us in the mood for what's ahead. In the first cutscene, we're introduced to some new characters in the Ape Escape universe. There's Aki, who is a friend of Natsumi from the previous two games, and there's Satoru and Sayaka, who are Aki's nephew and niece, respectively. If you're wondering why I'm using the Japanese names for these characters, it's because in the European version of the game, this is what they're called. Whereas in America, they were given more westernised names. For example, Satoru is Kai, and Sayaka is Yumi. The voice acting is also completely different depending on which version you play, which makes it quite complicated to go through all of the differences. But it's not really all that important, so I'll just move on. The basic plot setup is that Spectre has once again escaped and gained the help of a human scientist called Dr. Takumi. Together they've created a TV station that's taken over the world's airwaves and put the world into a trance-like state. The only people in the whole world who haven't been affected by this are Natsumi, Aki, Satora, and Sayaka, and the reason for this isn't really ever explained, but let's just roll with it, I guess. Natsumi contacts Aki and explains that the protagonists from the previous two games are stuck in a trance and so can't help put a stop to Spectre's reign of terror, and so she asks if Aki can help instead. 
Being a responsible guardian, she instead forces a nine-year-old nephew and niece to go and stop him because I guess she's just too lazy to do it. She builds a teleporter which allows the kids to warp to the different TV stations around the world and shut them down one by one, and thus, the adventure begins. The voice acting in the European version is pretty bad. It just comes across as far too childish, and while I get that it's obviously a game aimed at kids, I think there's a balance in making a game that's aimed at kids but also appeals to adults, and Ape Escape 3 actually put me off a bit in this area. It's weird too, because in a lot of ways, the game is geared towards adults, with the references to films like Terminator and Friday the 13th, but the voice acting really does make me cringe. Hey, don't even... This is my creme caramel! The monkeys are all over town, and on TV, and everyone's... Uh, I can't explain it, but it's really bad! That hurts, sis! Tatoru, there you are! Oh yeah, by the way, just as a warning, I mispronounced Dr. Tamuki's name as Dr. Takumi throughout this entire video, and there's no way I'm re-recording all of that voiceover because it took ages, and I say his name a lot. So, sorry about that. This time we can choose to play as either a girl or a boy, which I think is a cool touch, but it's very stereotypical. The girl is wearing a bright pink outfit and is dressed in a skirt, while the boy loves sports and dresses in a baseball jacket. Just like the voice acting, it's a bit cringy to be honest. But hey, at least we're a step forward from where we were in Ape Escape 2. That really shows that you're a boy. I'd never be able to handle a place like that. Really, Ape Escape 3 is just more of the same from Ape Escape 2. There's not really that much different about the core gameplay. You start with only a couple of gadgets, the stun club and the monkey net, and you go through open levels finding the monkeys and catching them one by one. You can choose to play the game a bit more tactically, using all of the different gadgets to your advantage, or by using the basic stealth system, or, like me, you can just run in and swing your net around like a maniac. What's cool is that at the beginning of the game, you literally unlock something new at the start of every single level, which makes it feel super rewarding to progress through the game. The thing is, all of the unlockable gadgets you get are the exact same ones from both Ape Escape 1 and 2. So there's the Dash Hoop, Monkey Radar, RC Car, Sky Flyer, Sling Back Shooter, and Waternet. So this actually ends up making the game feel a tad predictable if you've played the other ones, just because you know exactly what's coming. Ape Escape 1 actually technically has more gadgets than 3, because you don't get the Magic Punch gadget, which was awarded to you after finishing the game in the original. I suppose a good thing about the returning gadgets though, is that the additions made to Ape Escape 2, the Banana Rang, Electro Magnet and Water Cannon, don't return in Ape Escape 3. This is definitely for the best, because those gadgets were rubbish and way too context sensitive. Whereas all of the gadgets featured in Ape Escape 3 either serve multiple purposes, or are just fun to use generally, which make them memorable. Just for an example, the dash hoop can be used as a weapon if you run into monkeys or other enemies, but it can also be used simply to make you move faster, acting as a makeshift run feature. There's also a few moments where you'll have to use two gadgets together, so an example of this is standing on a pressure switch and using the RC car to apply pressure to another switch, and then having to shoot a button with the slingshot while keeping the pressure on the switches. It's pretty cool having these light elements of puzzle solving, and it keeps the game feeling varied and fast paced. The thing is with this though, is that although it's great that the gadgets work like this, this is all stuff that was done way back in Ape Escape 1. So what does 3 bring to the table that's fresh? Well, the main new ability in Ape Escape 3 is the Morph Gear, which allows your character to transform into six forms that are unlocked as the game progresses. All of these temporarily change the way your character moves, what their attack style is like, their capture method, and gives them other abilities too, like fire resistance or to walk on tightropes. The major drawback to using any of these morphs though is that you can't use your normal gadgets while in them. So if you don't know where a monkey is and you need to use the monkey radar for example, you'll have to exit out of the transformation to do so. In order to use a transformation you'll have to build up your morph gauge which is displayed next to your health. To do this you can either just wait and let it fill up over time or collect morph energy in the form of these little green collectibles. You can also upgrade how many times you can morph in a row by visiting the shop. 
All in all, I like these transformations and they give the game quite a bit of variety. What I will say though is that some of them are used way more frequently than others, which seems a bit unbalanced, but they all have the uses in at least one level. An issue I had generally with this game is that there's very, very few examples of coming across something in a level that you need a gadget or morph that you haven't unlocked yet to get around, and this can make the backtracking portion of the game feel a bit tacked on. Most of the time you could have gotten all of the monkeys in your first run through of the level, but you booted out after getting a certain number to leave some monkeys behind for you to go back for. But there's not really that much point in this a lot of the time. It's not too much of a problem because the levels are fairly small when you know the layout, but it does feel like padding when you get to a certain point. I wouldn't say that this game has bad backtracking, but it's also not an example of backtracking done well either. Just like with Ape Escape 2, bosses break up the normal levels by appearing after every three or four standard stages. These bosses are normally defeated by using a particular morph which you gained in the previous stage, but they can be beaten without morphing if you're up for a challenge. The boss battles themselves vary in quality quite a lot. White Monkey is pathetically easy, Blue Monkey is an okay fight but a little bit boring, Yellow Monkey is one of the better fights but is still pretty easy to get through, Pink Monkey is perhaps the third best boss in the game, being a little bit tougher than most of the others and being a good fight generally, Red Monkey is easily the best fight of the Freaky Monkey 5 bosses, having multiple stages that get smaller and darker until you reach the top of a tower where the floor is covered in rotating blades and you stood at opposite sides of a bridge. It actually feels quite climactic. Then there's the worst boss in the entire game with Dr. Takumi, which is just plain awful because the entire fight takes place inside of a robot and the controls are absolutely abysmal. In fact, all of the vehicles in the game are extremely forgettable because they aren't used very much. But that's probably a good thing because whenever I did come across one, I hated it. There's a boat which works the same as it did in the first and second games, there's a car which I just couldn't get to grips with controlling very well, and there's the aforementioned robot which is by far the worst vehicle in the game. All of the vehicles have you move the left and right analogue sticks in different ways to do different movements. So for example with the boat, you rotate one of the sticks to move a particular oar on the boat, which actually makes sense. But with the car, you seem to have to press the left stick up to go forward and then use the right stick to turn. Which, come to think of it, is actually how you drive the vehicles in Halo. But in Ape Escape 3, it just doesn't work well and constantly feels stiff. It's like the car just doesn't turn tightly enough and just results in you smashing into the barriers constantly. The robot though is just a whole other level. You move the left stick forward to turn right and the right stick forward to turn left and move them both forward or backward to move forward or backward. Then you have to press R3 or L3 to do a right or left punch and press both together to do a dash attack. On top of all of this, you can also jump by pressing the sticks towards each other. So yeah, you can probably see how this is really overly complicated. Something as simple as turning a corner can be difficult, so imagine fighting a boss with this control setup. Oh yeah, tanks are a thing in Ape Escape 3 as well. Jeez, the vehicles really are forgettable, aren't they? The tanks are okay, but still very, very underutilised. It seems like all of the returning vehicles from Ape Escape 1 are the halfway decent ones, but the new ones are just utter rubbish. Anyway, I was talking about the bosses before I got sidetracked there. The last boss is against Spectre and this is probably the best in the whole game and by far the most difficult. I actually died a few times on this while I was working out what to do. You're on a floating platform taking on this massive robot which goes through multiple phases, constantly blasting you with lasers and fire, and then you land on the robot and destroy its head which deactivates it, putting an end to Spectre's plan once again. Despite the bosses being a bit hit and miss, the levels are fairly consistently good, and a lot of the reason for that is that each level has a completely unique theme which is based around a particular film or TV genre. So we've got a soap opera level, horror level, sci-fi level, martial arts level, and some levels are even based off of a single film exclusively. Like the sinking of the Montanic level, which is obviously a parody of James Cameron's Titanic. 
Not only does this make every level stand out, but it's also a nice framing device to put the monkeys into loads of different situations. They're just as expressive as always, and I've got to give a special shout out to the animations in this game. They're way ahead of the time. Not just in how the monkeys move and react to things around them, but even how the player character moves. It's like they've got a lot of weight and they actually feel relatively realistic to control because of how they'll do a really subtle stumble when they change directions or begin running. One of the extra things to do in Ape Escape 3 is to visit the Fortune Zone, where you can do things like read horoscopes and test how romantically compatible you are with another person. So, let's see what my fortune is for today. Leave that scab alone. How does it know? The graphics themselves are amazing too. I mean, this has got to be one of the best looking games in this style on the PS2. It might not come across in this video because of how I recorded the footage straight from the PS2 itself, but it really does look incredible. I think with a bit of smoothing and upscaling, this could easily pass for a PS3 era game for sure. One major area I thought the game could have potentially done a bit better was in the camera department. While you can fully control the camera by using the D-pad to rotate it, you obviously can't move with the left stick and do this at the same time. So if you want to be able to do this, you'll need to stop dead in your tracks just to look where you want to go. For the vast majority of the game, I just ignored the D-pad controls completely and just snapped the camera behind me constantly. This works okay, but it's not ideal, and it makes it difficult to focus on a specific monkey if it's running around a lot. There's also a first person mode, which I didn't really ever use, but I suppose it's nice to be there if you want to take a closer look at your environment. The controls are mostly identical to how they were in Ape Escape 2. It even still has that problem with the Skyflyer, where if you use it while jumping forward, you'll suddenly lose all of your momentum as it floats you up which just feels clunky and awkward. I mentioned this in my Ape Escape 2 video, but the strange thing with this is that they got it spot on with Ape Escape 1. In that game, I was flying all over the place because of how good it felt to use, but with the second and third games, it went from being my favorite gadget to probably one of my least favorites. The underwater swimming sections from the first and second games have been completely removed too. I'm not sure exactly why this is, maybe they thought it didn't control very well, but to be honest, if they thought that, they also should have gotten rid of the vehicles too. So, rather than being able to go underwater and fully swim around and explore, whenever you go underwater now, you only dive a slight bit and the camera stays above water, so really this function only exists now to swim under short barriers and that sort of thing. One absolutely major thing this game adds in though is the ability to quickly change what gadgets you have equipped. I literally cannot understate what a difference this makes to the whole game. With Ape Escape 1 and 2, I hated coming up to an area where I needed a gadget that wasn't currently assigned to a face button, because you had to go into a menu, find the gadget, equip it, and then exit the menu, and it just completely ruined the flow. Now though, you can just double tap one of the face buttons and then keep pressing it to cycle through all of the gadgets and then stop on the one you want. If they ever remade Ape Escape 1, which I'm calling it now, I think we'll see an announcement for that fairly soon, this is a feature that I want implemented for sure. Do you want to hear a really inappropriately distressing scream in a kid's game? Well, here you go. One thing I kinda miss from Ape Escape 1 is the Spectre coin collectibles. There were just these hidden things put into secret areas in the game that are often out of the way and sometimes not near monkeys. It just gave you something to do in the levels besides catching the monkeys constantly. I appreciated the added variety there. I guess Ape Escape 3 does have a sort of similar collectible in the form of these cameras which unlock short films in the Simeon Cinema, but they just aren't as rewarding to find and they're always right next to the monkeys anyway. Something they improved substantially going from Ape Escape 2 to 3 is the hub area and the way that coins are spent. So basically in Ape Escape 2 you had this room as the hub where you could spend coins in the gotcha box to win something totally random. This could be art, music, a cutscene, or any one of a load of other things. The issue with this is that I wanted to choose what to spend my money on and maybe have more things to choose from too. 
Also, it took ages to spend the coins, because it took so long to put them into the machine, and then you win one thing and have to put coins in the machine and repeat this over and over. It was just dull. Now, however, there's an entirely separate area to the hub, which is called Market Street, and it basically just eliminates all of the issues I had with the coin system in the second game. Here, you can walk into a specific shop and buy a specific thing. There's still an element of randomness to it because you don't know which particular music track or cutscene you're gonna get, but at least you know you're getting a music track or a cutscene. There's also a store where you can buy lives, health and morph energy too, which makes the coins useful to collect for things outside of getting all of the extras. There's a ton of things you can get on Market Street, and it would take a good while to collect everything and truly 100% the game. So, I'm not going to be doing that for this video. Not only is there a hell of a lot of things to buy in the stores though, but there's also an absolutely insane amount of content to keep you playing, even after you've finished the story. So, there's your first playthrough of the game, there's the second playthrough where you capture every monkey that's been left behind and unlock the secret final boss which is pretty decent, but nothing all that special, by the way. Then you unlock survival mode, where you're challenged to go through the whole game with zero lives and no shops, and you have to catch every monkey, rather than just a few of them. There's the time trials, where you need to catch a few monkeys in the level as quick as you can to earn different medals. There's free play mode, which allows you to play through every level with all of the monkeys reset, which is useful if you missed any of the camera collectibles. And then there's the fact that you could play through the game as the other character too, to see how the cutscenes and interactions differ. I mean, that's a whole lot of content you get in there, and it's very impressive. But even on top of all of this, you've then got the mini-games, which are a staple of the Ape Escape series. I have to say, this game has by far the best mini-game in the whole series too, and to be honest, I was considering doing a full review of just this mini-game. Yeah, that's right, it's Metal Gear Solid. Being a big fan of Metal Gear Solid, I absolutely loved this. The premise is that Snake from MGS has gone missing while on a mission, and the Colonel contacts the Professor from Ape Escape to get the protagonists from that series to help find him. However, all of the kids from Ape Escape are at summer camp, and so can't help. So, obviously, the Colonel sends over Snake's battle data from his VR missions, and they import that data into a monkey helmet, making a monkey version of Snake. This snake then goes into the war zone and is contacted by the real snake, giving him advice and helping him along the way. Let me teach you how to operate the banana pistol. The game plays like Metal Gear Solid 1 or 2, but obviously quite a bit more simple and easy to understand. But it still retains a ton of the elements from the MGS series, like the top-down camera, the ability to aim in first person, pressing up against walls, collecting monkey tags, which is a cool reference to the dog tags in MGS2, and using different weapons to take on bosses and traverse levels easier. I mean, you even get a cardboard box for God's sake. Literally the only issue with this is that Snake and the Colonel aren't voiced by David Hayter and Paul Eiding, apparently due to them being unavailable at the time of recording. This is such a damn shame. To have heard Snake's iconic voice talking to a monkey from Ape Escape would have made me so happy. But still, the voice actors do a pretty good job. Snake is voiced by Peter Lorre, who voiced Vulcan Raven in MGS1, and the Colonel is voiced by Michael McCall, who has no relevance to the MGS series, so that's a bit of a weird one. Honestly, I think I enjoyed Metal Gear Solid more than I enjoyed Ape Escape 3, but that's probably just because it's basically a minigame full to the brim with fan service. If you're into Ape Escape and MGS, you'll absolutely love this. Calling it a minigame is doing it a disservice, to be honest. It's more of a short game than a minigame, it even has a separate save file. If you complete the game getting all of the monkey tags, you'll also unlock some bonus MGS-related films in the Simeon Cinema. Apparently this one was directed by Hideo Kojima, so let's give it a look. Okay. 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 Best thing Hideo Kojima's ever done.
I don't know what the hell was going on with the Ape Escape MGS cross promotion at this time, but there was also a minigame in Metal Gear Solid 3 called Snake vs Monkey, where Snake was tasked with capturing the Ape Escape monkeys, but in his game. This mode wasn't included in the HD remaster of the game for PS3 though, so I imagine there are some people out there that don't know this exists. You know, the reason this video has taken two years for me to make is that I've been waiting for it to be released as a PS2 classic on the PS4 for all this time. Now, I suspect that the reason it's never been put on there is because of this Metal Gear Solid game. With the Metal Gear Solid series being owned by Konami and Ape Escape being owned by Sony, I'm not sure if Sony could re-release Ape Escape 3 with the Metal Gear Solid game without permission from Konami. And now, there's probably some friction between Sony and Konami after Hideo Kojima left the latter to join the former. Either that or the reason they've not put it on the store is because they started development on a remake. The other two minigames in Ape Escape 3 obviously weren't going to be as good as Metal Gear Solid. But not only are they not as good, they're actually both quite bad. Monkey See Monkey Throw is a game where you spin a monkey around with the analogue stick and then let go at the right time to send the monkey flying and then the throw distance is measured. And that's it. The other minigame is a bit better. It's called Fists of Furry and it's a fighting game where you move the left and right sticks in different ways to execute different moves. I wasn't really very into this but I imagine the two player could be quite fun for a bit. So you might be asking, after all of this, how does Ape Escape 3 end? Well, basically near the very end of the game we suddenly get some character development with Dr. Takumi, which comes out of absolutely nowhere. We basically learn that the reason he's been working with Spectre is because he worked with the Professor while he was developing monkey helmets, but due to an accident he got one permanently attached to his own head, which is why he now wears a massive fake afro. The kids try to make him feel better, but Spectre appears on a monitor and laughs at him. Oh, shut up! Nothing wrong with a good laugh. It's not a good laugh if it hurts someone's feelings. This then makes Takumi side with the kids and betray Spectre. He takes the kids into space in order to blow up Spectre's satellite, which is still broadcasting the TV show. Now, wait a minute. What is it with the Ape Escape series and suddenly blasting us off into space? First Ape Escape 2 did this, and now 3 has gone and done it again. I mean, I guess it makes sense, but why couldn't they have picked somewhere else to do the final showdown this time? We then learn that Spectre's plan is to chop the world in two, having one half for humans and one half for monkeys. Obviously, this would destroy the planet, so the kids have to put a stop to his plans before this happens. So after finally beating Spectre, they learn that it's too late to stop the space station and the only way of doing it is to stay behind and detonate it manually. Dr. Takumi ends up staying behind and blowing it up, committing suicide and becoming a martyr in the process. Computer, are the children gone? Okay, self-destruct mode B. I haven't been so high on life for ages, Satoru, Sayaka. Meeting you meant everything to me. Farewell. Ah, uh, I really do love a good old suicide subplot in my kids' games. Satoru! The space station! No! Mr. Afro! Pink Monkey then appears on TV because you didn't actually catch her earlier, and to be honest I actually forgot about that, so it was actually quite a surprise when she appeared again. She lets Spectre free and this is where the whole backtracking section of the game begins. After doing all of that, you learn that Spectre is hiding in the remains of his space station and the final battle commences. You beat him fairly easily and then there's a scene after everything's returned to normal. You see a picture of the family and Dr. Takumi is there, hinting at the fact that he somehow survived. In the credits, we are blatantly shown that he survived and is now living with the kids and Aki, because I guess to have him actually die would be a bit much. This game's story is kind of all over the place. It starts out being simple and then suddenly makes you care for Dr. Takumi, then he kills himself and the game ends. 
I feel like in order for that to have worked, there needed to be a more complex storyline going on in the main story too, because it just feels extremely random having actual story development come out of nowhere so late in the game. Also, the ending isn't very satisfying because we don't even see what happened to Spectre, so the whole resolution aspect of it doesn't quite work for me. Ape Escape 1 is the only game in the series to have a good story because it actually develops throughout and makes Spectre out to be an actual threat rather than a bit of an idiot. It also has way more character development with side characters like Buzz, the Professor and Natalie all getting kidnapped at certain points. The stakes feel a lot higher in that game, whereas here it never feels like it quite reaches a climax. Overall though, this is a great game. I would say it's better than Ape Escape 2 because of being more fine-tuned. It has less gadgets, but that's for the best. The new transformations add another layer of complexity and variety to the standard gameplay. The new hub area is far, far better. The levels are all unique, and the quick select for the gadgets is amazing. However, I don't think Ape Escape 3 quite matches the first game in terms of quality. The story isn't as good, the vehicles are far worse, and let's be honest, Ape Escape 1 was the game to first introduce the control style, the gadgets, the monkeys, and everything that makes Ape Escape, Ape Escape. And really, 3 just takes all of this and gives you new levels. It doesn't do anything to reinvent itself. The main issue with Ape Escape as a series is that the enemies besides the monkeys are a bit random and forgettable, and I think the reason for this is that there's practically no emphasis on combat. You just swing the stun club around and every enemy can be defeated like this. Even when there's a mini boss, they go down extremely quickly and easily, so if there was ever an Ape Escape 4, maybe they should do something to remedy that. I'd also like to see character customization in a new game, so you could change your clothes and hairstyle and stuff. I feel like that might be interesting. I'm giving Ape Escape 3 a 7 out of 10. I feel like it's on the very brink of being an 8 though. It's a great game, and anyone that's a fan of platformers, or Ape Escape generally, should definitely give this a go if they haven't already. It's a shame it's not on PS4, because that would make it so much more accessible. But you never know, it might happen one day. The only real issues are the camera being a bit difficult to precisely control, the vehicles all being annoying and boring, the bosses maybe being a bit too easy to begin with, and the voice acting being way, way too childish. The story is also a bit mediocre, but that's not too important in a game like this. The gameplay is still solid and rewarding, but I feel like it's becoming a little bit predictable at this point. And if a main series entry was to ever come out, I would want them to do something to really mix it up a bit. In a way, this was done with the morphing mechanic, but I feel like this wasn't enough of a feature to really make Ape Escape 3 stand out from 1 and 2. Well, that's it. I've done it. Me 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 Yeah, take that you stupid monkey. Well, I guess that's that then. Thanks for watching my review, I hope you enjoyed it. It's been a long time coming, that's for sure. Let me know in the comments what your favourite Ape Escape game is, and what you'd want to see from a remake or a sequel. And until next time, bye!